so much, Pamela. Um, I just want to say this is the nicest invitation I've received this year. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, all right. This evening, I'd like to revisit the show with you, which as you <laughs> But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it came about. You're probably thinking, what on earth is Picasso doing at the Frick? Well, we devised a show that was tailor-made for the Frick, a museum um, of Western European art from the Renaissance to the end of the 19th century. The basic premise of the show is that while there's no Picasso in the Frick, all of the Frick is in Picasso. <laughs> Marilyn McCulley and I set off to find the best drawings that would show the variety of ways in which Picasso interacted with some of the artists housed in the Frick and with other forms of art, such as African and ancient Iberian that are not. When I began working on Picasso at the Institute of Fine Arts in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, Picasso had been dead only for a few years. He died in 1973 at the age of 91. The enormous cache of work left behind in his various studios was then coming to light and being cataloged a more complete picture of Picasso's work was evolving with a particular focus on the decades of the 50s and 60s, which up until that time had been something of a terra incognito. While Picasso remained highly productive during these decades, the avant-garde had shifted from Paris to New York. And by the mid-50s, Picasso himself had pulled up roots in Paris, his home for half a century, and moved to the south of France. Oh, just sorry, I, I meant to show these a little bit earlier, but these are some of the masters in the Frick, Rembrandt, El Greco, Velazquez, familiar paintings to all of you, um, Goya's The Forge, or uh, Africa's Madame Dossonville. These are some of the artists Picasso cherished, and had he ever visited the United States, would have dwelt in front of them. Um, So I'm, I'm bringing us back to, to the south of France, um, where Picasso moved in the, in the mid-50s. And most of the artists of his generation um, had died or would die soon. Fundamentally opposed to abstraction, Picasso had little interest in abstract expressionism or its French equivalent. For the first time in his long working career, Picasso was out of step with the avant-garde, working in relative uh, seclusion in his various chateaux. What was the old wizard up to? Well, just to give you a little sampling of Picasso's late work, the themes that continued in his work in the, in the, in the late period, in the 60s and 70s, uh, I'm sorry, 50s and 60s, were, of course, the nude musketeers, or musketeer and the nude lovers, there's always a very strong erotic quality to, to his, his work, particularly his late work. Um, Celestinas, um, figures out of Spanish literature, which continued on in his work in his late years. And of course, the perennial subject of Picasso, the artist and model, with the artist as a kind of old wizened man standing in front of the imperturbable, eternally youthful model. In many ways, the subject of Picasso's late work was art itself and the world of the studio. And we see here a couple of different representations of the studio, which was a major theme in his late work. And at the core of his work in his last decades were his powerful meditations on the art of the past. He communed in paint and pencil with well-known masterpieces often in long series of works that stretched over months of intensive activity or intermittently over a period of years. Picasso seemed to be driven by a desire to extract the secrets of the masters he admired and to metabolize their works through his own formal vocabulary. They were part homage and part ingestion. I'm showing you here the Delacroix's Women of Algiers a painting which he translated into a series of 15 paintings and innumerable drawings in 1954 to 55. 
Velázquez's Las Meninas, the quintessential work of Spanish art, of course, attracted his attention in 1957. And to that, he devoted over 50 paintings, working furiously and in seclusion for a period of three months. And here's just one of the many examples. In Manet Dejeuner, Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe, um, sort of the Ur painting of modern art that combines all of the genres, the nude, the landscape, the still life, um, absorbed Picasso in a long series of work that stretched from 1957 to 1962. But why this obsession at the end? Didn't this indebtedness to the past generally belong to an artist's apprenticeship? The large body of variations created a curiously lopsided view of his work. For some critics, he appeared to have run out of steam, um, lacking subject matter and ideas for composition and needed props to keep his art alive. For, other, for others, his radical art about art prefigured postmodernism. This conspicuous present of the past and Picasso's late work prompted me to turn back to the beginnings the first 30 years, and to see how the whole affair, or the multiple affairs, began. We limited ourselves to drawing, the root of all other media, and perhaps uh, the least time-bound medium. And we set off to explore the origins and scope of Picasso's dialogue with the past at the inception of his career. This was, I'm, I'm now beginning with some of the works that were in the show. This self-portrait was painted in 1901 to 02. Picasso was 21 at the time. The design of the work occupies the space of the sheet without stifling it. Space is dynamic, advancing and receding. The impression that comes across is that of a living, pulsing presence. Different techniques, media, and levels of finish cohabit the sheet. There's a contrast between the delicacy and of the descriptive modeling of his features and the insistent trumpeting of the power of his hand in the radiating lines behind him. Here I am, and this is my hand, creating this image. The frontal head planted on wide shoulders, <clears throat> shrouded in a great coat, and the gaze convey a sense of authority as well as that of, a feeling of the feeling of the seer. Eyes are turned inward as well as outward while the center parted hair and the cravat give him a jaunty air. A great deal of information is conveyed through Picasso's sprightly lines at just a glance. He was not interested in completeness of rendering. The essentials of the subject are all there. This expansive field of space surrounding the figure uh, is also rich with illusion. Self-portraits of artists at the Louvre uh, known to Picasso, appear to hover in the background. The authority of Poussin, I'm showing you a detail of a self-portrait by Poussin in the Louvre. The romanticism of Delacroix. As he fashions his own image, landmark, uh, landmark images enter into the creative process, as if the young Spaniard were bidding for a place to settle into the, into the tradition of assumed to be adopted homeland. While he also seems to assert his proud Spanish roots, he was in fact nicknamed the Little Goya when he came to um, Paris, and this is one of Goya's famous self-portraits. And perhaps a little of the graphic energy of Van Gogh oops, uh, can also be detected in this early work. What strikes me is both the sense of authority he projects as well as a sense of flux, as if he were coming from some place deep in the past and on his way to an undefined future. Now let's go back to his past. I don't know why it's not advancing. Um, it seems to be frozen. I probably did something to it. Probably push something here. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Thank you. Born in Malaga in southern Spain in 1881, Pablo Ruiz <laughs> his natural talent was guided from birth by his doting father, Don Jose Ruiz Blasco, a provincial artist and a drawing instructor. We see him here in a rare photo, standing in the classroom in the Art Academy of Barcelona, surrounded by his students. With the, ubiqu the ubiquitous teaching tools of plaster casts in the background, although I don't see any here. As a painter, Father, uh, Picasso's father specialized in pigeons, as we see here in one of his most famous works. As you can imagine, he didn't go too far with that limited range of subject matter. <laughs> Family legend has it that Pablito drew before he could speak, and his first word was peace, short for lapis or pencil. But he didn't really need a pencil, scissors would do. With his mother's sewing scissors, he amused his sisters and cousins with the animals he snipped out of paper. He could feel his way around the edges, and he was already appropriating his father's pigeons. Pencil was a greater challenge, but at nine, his line could navigate the contours of the twisting body of a statuette of Hercules that stood in the family hallway, and to suggest the overlapping of its parts. Between the ages of nine and 16, he studied at three different academies in Spain where his father taught. The 11 and 12 year old Pablo submitted himself to the academic method of copying parts of the body from drawings in manuals or drawing from the flat as it is known. And by 14 went on to plaster casts of sculpture from the approved models, the Greeks, He acquired the time-honored techniques or conventions for creating three-dimensional form on the flat sheet through light and dark contrast, parallel um, or cross-hatched lines that suggest the sprinkling of light over the contours of the body. They could be bold and stand out, as we see in this work of some of the Spanish predecessors. I'm showing you a drawing by Murillo with very bold, a very bold form of hatching. Or they could be lightly stumped power in one of the leading schools in Spain, no doubt the Academia de San Fernando in Madrid. And this is where father and son parted ways. Picasso was an explorer in the visual realm. Cezanne, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Seurat had already mapped out a new territory in visual <laughs> representation. Breaking from the long accepted notion of the image as a faithful replica of its counterpart in the real world, they posited that an artwork was a complete unto itself, governed by aesthetic principles, which are reinvented by the artist or group of artists. Picasso moved forward with the new century. Art is a lie that makes us realize the truth, he said. Nevertheless, he took all the tools of his classical education with him. He discarded nothing. In these portraits of friends in Barcelona, we see that Picasso at 19 has shed the encumbrance of volume and opted for a swifter, more direct manner of representation in the spirit of Spanish modernismo. The body palpitates. Um, with, with the energy of his lines, setting off the more detailed features of the face. Character is conveyed through body language and dress. These drawings were part of his first public exhibition, which was held in a cafe uh, in Barcelona, El Quatre Gats. He didn't start out timidly. The hundred or so sheets he tacked up to the walls of the cafe were a direct challenge to one of the leaders of the modernismo movement. Raymond Casas, who was renowned for his stylish portraits. Casas and others were responsible also for the resurrecting of the long forgotten El Greco, designating him the patron saint of their modern idiom. And Picasso caught the enthusiasm for the master as well, and for Goya, and I'm showing you just a sketchbook page by Picasso around 1899, and a painting done in a 
a kind of symbolist uh, way that echoes the forms of El Greco in a little bit more sinister mode. Well, it could have gone on doing these types of variations drawing from the Spanish tradition, but he needed a bigger venue and he moved across the Pyrenees. After making preliminary trips to Paris between 1900 and 1904, Picasso settled there for the next 50 years. At the Amboise Volard Gallery, he saw the latest works by Degas, Cezanne, Bonnard, and Gauguin, and I'm showing you just some examples of their work that he might have seen at the Volard Gallery, characteristic of this time. Um, and he absorbed their bold forms and radiant color. By 1901, Picasso had his own two-man show at the Volar Gallery. He had not found a manner of his own, but was trying out the options around him. This Nabi-inspired pastel in our exhibition was part of that historic show. But it was not only modern and contemporary works that would have attracted his attention in the early years in the capital. A new phenomenon was occurring I'm showing you an example of work, of just a little collage of works, of drawings going from top to bottom by Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and on the bottom, Ribera, Durer, and Anne. For a brilliant young draftsman who had just completed his academic training in a matter of years, the display of drawings by the Italian, Dutch, Flemish, and French masters would have been eye-opening if not overwhelming, and undoubtedly stirred his competitive spirit. In 1900, the Louvre published a catalog of some 2,000 drawings by the masters, dating back to the early Renaissance, which were installed in the galleries of the museum for a few years at a time. Drawings in private collections were coming to light as well through new means of photographic reproduction. And, and were produced in both luxury and mass-produced portfolios. Exhibitions of drawings in large numbers were being staged. Old master drawing was, was new and in the air in Paris. His poet friends wrote essays and reviews about drawing. Picasso and his generation were among the first to have such wide access to original works of paper dating back centuries. This abundance of evidence of past achievement gave Picasso the opportunity to imagine his own place within the ongoing tradition of drawing from the beginning of his career. This may help us to understand Picasso's ambition as a draftsman and his desire to encompass it all. What if he'd remained in Spain? This mother and child of 1904 is a study for a blue period gouache. It's remarkable for its tenderness. We see that he's working out the posture of the figure and the positions of the hands. There's a process going on here before our eyes, a juggling of forms on the sheet, as well as an assimilation of forms and images of the past. El Greco continued to be an important inspiration in his blue period which may be reflected here in the el elongated body of the figure in the sensitive hands, which I've clipped here from the Frick's St. Jerome. Ingres, the greatest draftsman of the 19th century in a neoclassical vein, was a towering figure who could not be ignored. His drawings were on view at the Louvre, at the Universal Exhibition of 1900, and at the Salon des Indépendants. A catalogue resume had just been published of his work. In April of 1904, Picasso made a visit to Montauban, Angre's hometown, to visit the Musée Angre, which housed over 4,000 of his drawings. In drawing, Angre remained the gold standard for Picasso, Matisse, and their generation, and may still be today. I'm showing you um, a drawing by Angre of, of a figure for a, a painting of Stratonice, very similar in feel to, to, to the Picasso drawing. But perhaps even more telling, as Gary Tintoro once pointed out, Picasso appears in this particular work 
to borrow the look of old master study sheets that go back to Leonardo, Raphael, and Ingres. I'm showing you here an example by Ingres. This type of brainstorming sheet is prized by connoisseurs for its apparent artlessness. The sheet is not conspicuously, is not consciously composed, but disparate fragments share space with each other on a sheet of paper. Yet in the hands of a great artist, study sheets display an innate sense of balance and harmony, as we see here in the floating hands of Picasso's uh, mother and child. Such sheets are considered a true gauge of an artist's skill. The consciously contrived look of an old master study sheet points to the context in which Picasso wants his own drawing to be seen. As we saw in the self-portrait of 1902, this drawing too activates the space of the sheet of paper, but it goes a step further. Boy and Horse was made in 1905. Form and empty space interact and exchange roles. The void beneath the arc of the boy's legs becomes the form of the horse, which although not represented is present enough that the boy can sit on it and rest his hand on its rump. They exist in a gravitational sphere. Above the boy, the empty sheet is just empty space. Under the arm is a glimpse of the horse's mane. This is one of many studies for a painting that was not realized. It is experimental in technique as well, in the combination of harsh abstract outlines and rather sensitive modeling, which seem at odds with each other. What's notable about the sheet is the unusual angle of vision. The horse reared, uh, viewed from the rear <coughs> rather than from the characteristic side view creating a kind of defamiliarization. Picasso was aware of the power of this point of view from earlier artists, such as Degas, we see here in a, as we see in a sheet of drawings by Degas, or Pisanello, whose work he could have seen at the Louvre. While drawing from the past, the past does not determine the present. There is a core that is distinctly Picasso's. Picasso made a huge leap between 1904 and 1906. In this study uh, with, with a blue nude of 1906, there's an explosive quality that blows away all the refinement of the mother and child. Color and impetuous execution carry the work. The sheet is covered front and back with images of a nude and her face and hands. One rises to the foreground as if muscling her way to a starring role in his new monumental vocabulary. Here, the fibers that connect Picasso to the past stretch back further to a more remote and little known region. Newly unearthed examples of archaic art from Picasso's native territory of Andalusia in southern Spain had been on view in the Louvre in 1903 and caught Picasso's attention. And I'm showing you an example here of an ancient Iberian sculpture from Osuna. <coughs> they caught Picasso's attention for their blocky forms and mask-like heads. They provided an origin in the most ancient layer of artistic expression of his native land and pointed the way to an authentic form of expression which he was trying to find. In this drawing, also of 1906, Picasso pursues his interest in the simplified forms of Iberian art and Gauguin. And yet, his manner of execution is unexpectedly and almost perversely perfected in the academic or classical manner. As I mentioned before, he never threw anything away. We see here a wide range of handling from energetic hatching to the smoothest gradations of tone through which he brings out the volume of the figures. His primitive idols are suspended between idioms, a conflict that Picasso liked to exploit, adding vigor and conceptual interest to his drawings. Highly polished finished drawings such as this one also serve as periodic reminders. 
yes, I am a great draftsman. And this is the, the painting for which it, 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 to which it is related. This powerful sheet of 1907 shows Picasso's increasing alienation from the formal vocabulary of Western European art, which seemed depleted of power. Brilliant color, geometric form, and emphatic outlines deliver an electric bolt, the means through which he gives new life to the most traditional of subjects of Western art the female nude. In fact, you could almost picture this, this figure as a model posing on, on a um, dais. An interest in an African and Indonesian art was circulating among the avant-garde artists. And Picasso described later in life his first visit to the Ethnographic Museum in Paris, the Musée de l'Homme, as a revelation. Face to face with fetish objects and masks that he saw there, he said that he realized for the first time that art is a form of magic or exorcism, a defense against evil, destructive forces. It was that kind of ferocity of expression that he channeled into one of his earliest masterpieces, the Demoiselle d'Avignon. I'm showing you just some <coughs> relation to a, a thong uh, mask, the type of thing he would have seen at that time in the Ethnographic Museum. It was the, that kind of ferocity of expression that he channeled into his earliest masterpiece, uh, the groundbreaking Demoiselle d'Avignon of 1907, for which the yellow nude is a study. As sophisticated an observer as Georges Brock, whom Picasso met around this time, described the experience of seeing the Demoiselle as like drinking gasoline, gasoline and eating fire at the same time. <laughs> While the Demoiselle d'Avignon is a full-scale assault on the tenets of naturalistic art, Picasso arrived at the end result in a very traditional way, working up his composition through hundreds of drawings, showing us the vital importance of thinking through drawing in the conception and realization of his major works, a method learned at the Academy. And I show you just a, another a proof of of the, the, as I say, the some hundred drawings that do lead up to the Demoiselle d'Avignon. From that point on, um, and through the next seven years, Picasso worked in a creative partnership with Brock. These next two drawings show Picasso standing on the shoulders of a giant, <laughs> Cezanne, who had died in 1906, leaving a huge void and a large legacy for the new generation to digest. These two bathers, both of which were in the exhibition, are homages to Cezanne's late bathers, but in a new key. Figure and ground are broken up into geometric parts and form a continuous rhythmic whole. Here, the same concept is treated in two different ways. One in a buckling, colorful, low relief mode in the other, in a darker manner, in which the forms are, are submerged in a field of graphic energy, wild hatching lines, which both subsume and form space. An example of Cezanne's bathers, just to kind of go back and forth a little bit with them. Here again, Cezanne, a master of the tabletop still life, and perhaps Spanish 17th century masters of, of, of the still life, are points of departure for Picasso's new creation. In this beautiful finished drawing, objects are reduced to dynamic, curved, wedge-like shapes that occupy different pockets of space. Single point perspective is given way to a pluralistic space. The tabletop seen from above the compote dish from the front, the cup from above, the chocolate pot from the front and from above. Yet all the parts respond to one another and create a coherent dynamic whole. Picasso knits them together through his repetitive strokes of dry brush and wash, creating a textured membrane 
which allows slivers of the white paper to breathe through. The objects advance and recede. They gleam and glisten. Yet another enormous leap heading in the development of cubism is seen between that 1909 still life I just showed you and this violin of 1912. It's only three years between them. The tradition of the still life with musical instruments is a long one. And who was always a reference point of Picasso's drawings was a master of the violin. There was an exhibition of drawings in Paris that year and it included his violin. For Picasso, the violin offered elegant abstract shapes, curves, straight lines, scrolls, and epoles. 19th century trompe l'oeil artists like Harnett depicted violins, but here Picasso's image is nothing like a faithful replica of, the phys of its physical counterpart. It presents instead a very tenuous hold on reality, the physical world in flux, which mirrored the modern outlook and its lack of certainties. Yet, what gives this drawing its sensual appeal in underlying familiarity despite its newness that tantalizes the viewer? Is he reworking old territory? He's using in a way the same basic drawing materials, black chalk, and attains the same range of light and dark that he did with his torso made back in the academy. And he employs the same technique of parallel and cross, uh, parallel, parallel and cross hatching lines and stumping. But now the volume is optional. Lines can serve as edges, curves as contours, but they can also refer to themselves um, as free floating abstract elements. The meaning of the marks can be read in more than one way and are determined by the context, which shifts from one part of the drawing to another. What is consistent is the level of refinement and the energy of the markings on the sheet laid down with a nervous, precise hand. The old, illusion, the old illusionistic manner of representation is dismantled and partly reassembled. The aura of the disembodied object remains as a set of signs that refers to both the object and the basic elements of representation. Picasso's appetite for experimentation remained undiminished after the war, as we see in these two drawings made in 1915. He had so many alternatives up his, up his sleeve for every problem. A seated man on a chair can be this way, more Angresque than Angre himself, that, as we see here in this beautiful drawing in the Met um, of Amboise Vollard. Or it can be this way, as we see um, in, in the figure, which is built up of flat decorative planes that advance and recede in space. Same subject, same year. Here he places historic traditions on equal footing with his own original creations. Style is now treated as a set of available conventions to appropriate, transform, and recombine. None has any greater claim to truth. We see Picasso here in 1917 at age 36. Picasso was now, by now, an acknowledged master and he conveys this through his total control over line and through minimal means, the minimal means of this powerful self-portrait of 1917. <laughs> and his line was also, um, also often full of humor. In 1917, he was invited to design sets and costumes for the Ballet Russe and in the process, he met and married one of the ballerinas, Olga Koklova. One ballerina recalled that he would often sit on the sidelines while the dancers rehearsed and make drawings of them with that wry smile in that witty line of his, which is so beautifully evoked in this, this wonderful drawing that was in our show, um, 
showing his penchant for parody. But he could not long resist the pull of monumental sculptural drawing, and he returned to it periodically throughout his life. Our show ended with large pastels from a summer spent in Fontainebleau, outside of Paris, where the famous chateau of Francois I stood and where Leonardo da Vinci was once the king's guest. There were great murals covering large expanses of ceiling by Rosso Fiorentino and Primaticcio, and the gardens were filled with statues in terracotta and stone. These were potent stimuli for Picasso. Both of these drawings were made at, during his summer in Fontainebleau. And in them, he demonstrates his virtuosity in pastel through the finesse of his blending of colored chalk. The one um, on the, let's see, is that the right? I guess it is. Left, yeah. The one on the left is from Basel. And in it, Picasso speaks in a neoclassical tongue. The head is a blend of a generic Greco-Roman statue with the same eyes we saw him copying back at the age of 11 and it's inflected with the features of his wife. Here the surface is dry and granular, a texture which suggests the dryness of a terracotta head. In the other, he creates a different dewy texture of youthful rosy skin in modern 20s dress. William Rupert speculated that it might be an image of Sarah Murphy, the wife of the painter Gerald Murphy, but her identity is not known. The classical still informs the work, but it's now in an updated classicism bequeathed to him by a master he adored, Renoir, who had died only a few years earlier. In each of these works, drawing competes with both painting and sculpture, whose qualities it imitates and displays its preeminence over both. Our show ended in 1921, but I certainly don't want to leave you with the impression that Picasso made a complete circle from his academic training through the radical phase of Cubism back, uh, back to classicism and just settled in there. It was only a, tr a temporary rest in beloved territory. It was all about to explode again under the pressure of a new movement of surrealism, which was launched with a written manifesto by the poet Andre Breton in 1925. Here we see his famous Three Dancers of 1925. Breton called for the exploration of extreme states of emotion in art and literature and for the unleashing of the irrational side of man. With surrealism, a new notion of convulsive beauty was born, and Picasso was regarded as the leader of the movement by younger artists, although he was never a certified member of the group. As we see here, it was a far cry um, uh, from his comedic dancers of 1919 in pure outline. The middle years of Picasso's life, his 40s to his 70s, took place against the backdrop of the major upheavals of the century and his new vocabulary reflected the horrors and the instability of the Spanish Civil War, World War II, the occupation and the liberation of Paris. During these years, he also rose to unprecedented heights of fame as the greatest living artist and an artist of enormous wealth. As John Berger sardonically put it, he didn't need money, he could just draw what he wanted. So I show you just a few examples of his surrealist drawings, such as these pen and ink drawings made after Grunewald's famous altarpiece of 1932. Um, I think they're among his most beautiful searching works. Here are a few more examples from that series. He's using the wash technique that Goya excelled in. Um, not surprising that he would turn to Goya um, when interpreting a work of, of this anguish and power. 
And I just want to breeze through just a, a few examples of, of this period. I want to go back to the, the 60s uh, at the end, but to show you just the ever explorative side of because of the many different ways you could take the same theme and develop it in so many different ways from realistic to sculptural to highly expressionistic as we see in this set of three heads or his constant manipulation of the human body in, in classical form, his constant return to the classical line, linearity, to these assemblages, um, very humorous creations of the body and from an assembly of parts, again to late cubist works. And I show you just a few examples of this drawing in connection with one of his last great masterpieces, Guernica. Because of this is this is number one in the series of drawings that are now on view at the Reina Sofia in uh, Madrid, alongside the, uh, the the great painting Guernica of 1936, uh, 37, I guess it's written there. Um, this is number one in the series, and Picasso once said, he said it's curious that. The first vision always remains intact. And you can see in, the, in this very preliminary sketch that all of the major elements are already in play. The woman lunging in through the window holding her lantern, um, the dead horse on the ground and the bull. Um, all, all, so the basic elements are already there in the very beginning. And here are just a few more steps along the way in the process. Picasso once said that it would be interesting to record the process, to keep all the images, um, to record the, 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 the creative process in the making. And he was very careful about numbering and dating all of his drawings because he was very concerned with preserving his own creative process and looking back at it. So these lead us to, to Guernica. I want to jump now back to that, that sort of terra incognito that I began with uh, the 50s and 60s because that's what launched in a way looking back to the beginning with the question of what was it? How did those masters enter into Picasso's work? Um, why were they such a big presence in his, in his late work? And I'll show you a few more examples of the variations. This is Courbet's um, Demoiselle au bord de la Seine and because of his interpretation of it done in 1950. Okay. So at the outset of his career, as we've seen, Picasso's drawings were full of oblique references to the styles and techniques of past masters, as if he were placing his images in a temporal context and affirming his participation in an unbroken, continuing process of drawing. But in the variations, the continuum is compacted into a single forceful clash that takes place over the lineaments of a particular work of the past, plucked out of its time frame and propelled into the present. And here are some more examples, um, another example of, from the series of, of um, the women of Algiers, the very last one in the series. I've always loved these works for the poignancy of the battle that Picasso waged in old age to keep his art alive and to situate his achievement in, a, in an historical context. His suites of variations are private works that required a, an heroic effort Yet the scale of some of them, some of the paintings, with their often dizzying forms and brushwork and overloaded with paint, can sometimes seem to topple over with the dilemma of the modern artist entrapped in the past, unable to fight his way out of it. Through the experience of the drawing show, another aspect of Picasso's variations came into view for me, the drawings those connecting links between the big 
impressive canvases, which I had largely overlooked. I show you a few examples of drawings from the series. I see more clearly now how they weave in and out of the past with a suppleness and undiminished energy that makes them quintessentially Picasso's. With, its, with the weightlessness and timeless quality of drawing, the weightlessness of line and drawing's timeless quality, perhaps drawing is better suited to the task of transmitting the past into the present and perhaps more eloquent about their sources than the more labored paintings. Because those drawings are ingenious in their sheer inventiveness and skill and often awesome in their refinement. But they're also meditations on drawing. He brought a modern self-consciousness, uh, he brought a modern self-conscious awareness to the nature of the medium and to its ongoing tradition. And he worked within and against it. His extraordinary manual dexterity was matched by a connoisseur's eye and a historian's sense of the past, as well as an inquisitive and playful mind that threw everything up for grabs. Perhaps it was the power of drawing that allowed Picasso to create, at the end of his life, one of his most powerful images in which he confronts death nakedly without a mask or a filter. And here's his self-portrait of 1972. There's a phrase that I always loved of Picasso's, which I used to tell my daughters when they were young. Picasso said to a friend in later years, and I think this comments beautifully on, on the trajectory we've seen. He said, when I was a child, I could draw like the old masters, but it took me a lifetime to draw like a child. So that's um, where I end, and I'm happy to take any questions.